I'm very happy to show you today the work we're doing on a sim combustion simulation uh, at Surfax. Um, of course, it's a, it's a teamwork. You have all the names here of the researchers who are working with me, and we, you will see also student names <coughs> from time to time on the slides. So, um, simulation applies to uh, uh, combustion simulation applies to many systems. But today, uh, I will uh, restrict my talk to aeronautical burners, and I will start with some motivation. Of course, we all know this kind of motivation: um, emissions, strict regulations, increasing but also um, uh, sorry, more economical constraints like uh, decreasing the cost of manufacturing and maintaining uh, engines. Um, so um, we can decline that in some uh, a kind of list of uh, uh, challenges for this kind of uh, engines. We have technical challenges. Typically, uh, you are concerned with the temperature field in the chamber so that it does not burn. It it has a long lifetime. We also are concerned by uh, emissions and uh, stability and ignition. And these technical challenges, in fact, uh, uh, can be translated into um, technic scientific challenges here. Uh, we need to control aerodynamics and mixing, of course, turbulent combustion, including the, um, as exact as possible, chemistry of kerosene. We, take to we need to take into account uh, the droplets, the liquid fuel droplets inside the burner, and heat transfer uh, uh, problem. So all these uh, physics are uh, uh, summarized in this sketch here. And our objective at Surfax is to uh, provide numerical tools that uh, involve as much as possible all these uh, physics and their coupling. So for that, of course, we use advanced uh, CFD and massively parallel computer computing, as I will uh, show in a minute. So for that, um, we need a code that takes uh, into account uh, all these physics. And so our, um, the first thing, the first choice we have to do is uh, about the turbulence modeling. And at Surfax, we are uh, really developing uh, uh, very strongly the uh, larger dissimulation technique uh, because it has proven to uh, be really uh, predictive in many situations at a cost that is that is high, it is expensive simulation, but it's still um, uh, reasonable and even uh, usable in the industrial context. Uh, our uh, industrial partners at in France now, they use on the day-to-day -day basis um, LES codes for the design of combustion chamber. Uh, so we, uh, we need to incorporate uh, modeling uh, in, in our codes, of course, to, 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 to describe all the physics I just mentioned. So again, we start with larger dissimulation, so we need subgrid scale modeling. Uh, we need to do something about uh, the, uh, the fuel. So uh, again, uh, we need to find a surrogate for kerosene, which is a complex uh, mixture of many hydrocarbons. And you ha we have to apply uh, chemical kinetics to, to, to this surrogate. So this is a, a very difficult topic. Uh, we need uh, to use a, a liquid uh, phase solver. So in our code, we use both Eurian and Lagrangian formulations for the liquid phase. And we need, of course, a turbulent combustion model. Uh, and in what I will show uh, is mostly uh, based on the second flame uh, approach. Um, and with that, we need also uh, numerics. So for larger dissimulation, you need higher order schemes, typically third order. For complex geometries like these ones that are shown here, uh, you need unstructured grids, and of course you need high performance computing. This is a key part of this, uh, all these projects. Just mentioned here boundary conditions. This is, uh, this is, this is a very important to, uh, to uh, ensure, to guarantee the reliability of, of the simulation. And the problem is that it is often uncertain. I mentioned that now because I, I will uh, go back to this point later. Um, so I will not uh, develop all these uh, modeling aspects today because uh, I will not go into the technical details of that because it would be too long. But if you're interested, of course, we can take uh, as much time as you want in during lunch or breaks to discuss that. And it's all in papers and published uh, stuff. So what I will do now is uh, um, showing you a few examples of application of LES to, to uh, combustion, so trying to give you a flavor what, what, what we can do with that what we can expect from that and how we validate that. Uh, first of all, 
we need a code. So what all what I will show you is uh, performed with the code AVBP, sorry, which is um, a code developed at Surfax uh, with uh, IFP Energie Nouvelle in, in France. Um, so it's, it has all these particular um, features. So it computes external and internal flows. It's fully compressible because as you will see, we are interested in the acoustic behavior of, of burner. Uh, it uses DNS, but mostly LES approach. So again, on the numeric numerical parts, we use unstructured uh, hexahedral or tetrahedral grids or even hybrid meshes. It's massively parallel. It's explicit in time. It uses uh, second and third order uh, finite differences, finite volume schemes. So it has a list of a series of different modeling approaches. So for the subgrid gate models, the, the classical Smagorinsky, uh, model, but, uh, but also the dynamic model and also the whale model that is um, uh, interesting uh, for the, uh, to get a correct uh, behavior of, the of wall flows. Uh, we use acoustic uh, boundary conditions. We use reduced or tabulated uh, chemical kinetics. Uh, I guess, as I already said, we use a second flame turbulent uh, combustion model and we have a uh, multi-phase solver. So this code has been applied to many different uh, uh, practical systems, but I will again, as I said, uh, focus today on aeronautical burners. As I said, HPC is a key aspect of all of this. LES is uh, really demanding in terms of CPU time. So you have here an, an, an illustration of what we uh, uh, are able to do now um, on the on uh, this kind of uh, configuration. You have here the different s the size, uh, mesh sizes here. So this is strong scaling. And you can see we, uh, we, can, uh, we could do tests up to more than 60,000 uh, processes with a very uh, uh, interesting <coughs> speed up. So this to, to obtain this kind of curve and maintaining this kind of curve uh, while our, uh, computer architectures are constantly uh, evolving, it's a real effort. Uh, it takes us a lot of time, uh, but it's, it's worth doing it. But it's really necessary to, to spend a lot of time on that. Okay, so I think that we now will start with a few examples. The first example I want to show is about ignition. Uh, you all know that ignition is a, a, a crucial aspect of uh, engine development and certification. Why? Because you need to ensure uh, that um, your um, ignition map is uh, uh, high, in, uh, I mean, um, is large enough in, in this domain in terms of air and, and fuel flow, flow rate. And most importantly, you need to ensure um, uh, re-ignition uh, in high altitude conditions. Uh, this is more difficult because at high altitude, your flow is cold and pressure is low, so it's really difficult condition for, for ignition, but of course you need to, uh, as a manufacturer, you need to guarantee that if your uh, engine stops, you are able to reignite it. So uh, if you go to, to books, uh, like uh, the, the book of Lefebvre, you, you can find a description of uh, ignition in three phases. First of all, you will spark an ignition system, like, like a spark plug, for example, to start a flame kernel. Then, in the second phase, the flame kernel will grow and um, <coughs> develop uh, in front of one of these burner in, in a typical uh, of, of a typical uh, chamber. Typically you have usually anaerobic chambers with uh, many burners uh, around it. So you first ignite one of uh, all these burners, and once you have ignited one burner at a, at a point somewhere, you need to uh, guarantee that the first flame will be able to uh, ignite the neighbors, that the flame will be able to, to propagate around the whole burner and ignite the full burner um, in a sufficient small time. So this is a third phase. So we will go step by step and see how we can uh, study this, uh, this phenomena. And the question to answer are more or less uh, where uh, and how deposit energy to make sure that I will trigger flame and uh, how to ensure burner to burner propagation. So first of all, we, ha we start always with the, with the validation step. This is uh, uh, an experiment uh, by, uh, what was published in, what that was published in Combustion and Flame. It's a jet, jet uh, ignited jet flow 
uh, ignited at a, uh, some actual distance here. And you will see on, on, on top the uh, on, on top you will see the uh, the experiment and on the bottom the simulation. And you can see uh, how the flame uh, develops somewhere uh, downstream uh, in, in the jet and <coughs> stays there some time before developing and propagating upward to the, uh, to the um, injector. And this is typically what is observed in, in, uh, in uh, burners, in aeronautical burners. The flame starts somewhere uh, downstream close to the uh, igniter that is usually placed quite down far downstream to the injector and then propagates uh, up, upwards to, to stabilize on the injector. And so this is a validation, a nice validation that shows that the simulation is able to recover the uh, global behavior of, of um, this, the phenomenon. So now you go, we, we apply, now that we have some kind of validation of that of on the, on the met, uh, simulation methodology, we can apply the same methodology to um, one sector of a real burner, so to see if um, we are able to really stabilize a flame in a swirled um, combustor as we can, as can be found in a, in a real chamber. So this was an experiment uh, uh, performed at Korea in the framework of the European uh, KI project. So you can uh, see here a detail of the injector or here. So it's a swirled uh, flow injector, uh, cl quite classical for this kind of, of, um, of uh, application. And um, so we did the simulation of that. So here we're not anymore in the validation step because, uh, because it's a real system. So we can see here how the flame develops here and the impact on the pressure field and the, and the, and the velocity field, okay? So what we can do uh, in comparison with experiment with this type of configuration is to see if um, in terms of probability of ignition, we recover the correct behavior, okay? You know that when you spark an engine, you rarely ignite it at the first part, and you don't always even ignite it. So there is a probability of ignition that can be measured in experiment, and we, 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 um, we are trying to get this probability also, in, or, and to understand this uh, probability by simulation. So, for example, what can be done is trying several position of the spark as in the experiment and see uh, uh, how um, what is the associated uh, probability of ignition and try to understand it and for example in the experiment these four uh, different positions so either a different uh, a distance from the uh, injector in the actual direction or uh, a side not on the actual uh, just just the side of the actual um, uh, on the central axis and um, so you can see that uh, depending on the, on the um, uh, ignition uh, lo igniter location, you have different uh, probability. For example, here you, ignite, you always ignite, but here we are too close to the, uh, to the injector, you, you have la ma far less uh, chances to ignite. Uh, so these uh, probabilities were uh, reproduced by LES and this is what is nice with simulation that you can try to understand why uh, this has a, such a big impact on the, 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 the igniter location has such a big impact on the, uh, on, on the ignition. And it was found uh, usually in this situation that it was because of too weak kernel that could not sustain the strong uh, turbulence uh, that would um, uh, eventually quench it. Um, now, next step is phase two, is going from one burner to the other. So this where there was again a first, another validation configuration here, so it was also at Korea. Um, they used a multi-burner uh, system, and what was nice is that uh, they could uh, change the number of igniters, of uh, injectors, sorry, in the system, so they could go from uh, uh, nine, uh, five burners to uh, four or three and two burners. So they doing that, they could uh, change the distance between uh, injectors and see uh, how the flame propagates 
uh, and what, how, it does, how the propagation changes when you change the distance. Typically, they found that when uh, the, the injectors are closed, uh, the distance is, uh, is small. It's more or less a radial propagation of the flame, but when you increase the distance between injectors, it becomes more actually uh, uh, develop flame development. This is what was observed um, experimentally. So you see the first uh, spark and you will see the, how the flame uh, propagates and first ignites the burners on the right here and then the, the injector on the left. So the question was, um, can we reproduce that and can we understand, for example, the order of, ignit of ignition of the different burners? Uh, this is what the simulation gives. So you have a, a side view here, and as in the previous slide, and a top view here. And you can really see here how the flame develops and first ignites the injectors at the, at the right on the side and finally at the left side. And this is mostly due to the uh, swirl motion, uh, global swirl motion of the flow because all the burners here are swirled. This induces a globally uh, rotational motion that goes uh, that goes that way, and then takes the flame closer to this right injectors before the one of the left. Uh, what is nice is that um, we could also reproduce the different modes of ignition depending on the distance between the burners. So here you have the five burners, and here only the two, and you can see in the five burners it really propagates radially. While when you increase the distance, the flame has more space to develop actually and it will go really something doing something like that instead of doing really something like that. So this is something that we don't want in a practical system because in a, in a practical system, uh, the, the geometry of the combustion chamber would not allow the flame to develop so far downstream actually. So this probably would lead to a failure of ignition. Okay, and uh, what was also nice that we could compare quantitatively uh, the results of the simulation with the experiment. So you have all the experiments in different colors here in terms of uh, integrated light signal that has was recorded and compared to the simulation and it it's matches quite well. Now full burner, still an uh, academic one because of only in uh, this kind of uh, academic configuration we can have sufficient diagnostics to make comparison. So this, was, this is a mica burner that was uh, built at uh, AM2C. Um, at Eco Centrale in Paris. So you have uh, 16 swirl injectors and they use propi propane and, and with, uh, thanks to these transparent walls they could uh, visualize the, the flame. Um, what I will show you here now is a simulation of the system. So you will have on the left, on the right here, the simulation results and here's the experiment. So you see first the, the, the start of ignition and then you can see in both cases this shape typical shape of the flame uh, as an arch fl flame and the propagation on the sides and also the uh, dissymmetry between both sides again due to the swirl, global swirl motion of, of, the, f of the flow and uh, it, it is comp f fully synchronized with time. Another uh, interesting thing was that we could, we did um, the same simulation with two different models so one with the uh, second flame model I already mentioned and another with the uh, tabulated model and we, we obtained the same curves, the same results. Here you can see uh, the, uh, again, the integrated light signal and uh, in reaction rate with time uh, for experiment here, the, the dots and uh, for both simulation in lines, dashed and, and solid line. This Disagreement at the end is just bef due to the fact that in the experiment uh, they, they ignited after um, some time after having uh, sent a mixture of propane, so they had some volume to burn outside the combustion chamber. So this is something we did not have in the in the simulation, of course. But that's not you sh so you should not uh, look at this uh, part. But you can see that both models uh, give a correct uh, answer. Okay, another example, I think I will skip that because uh, I will run out of time. This was just about uh, uh, combustion instabilities, but I, I will go directly to an, a third example, which is uh, supercritical flows in rocket engines. Uh -huh. 
when it comes to, to, to simulate uh, flows in rocket engines, you really come to very high pressure problems, about 100 bars, and very cold flows. Usually you inject below 100 Kelvin, both uh, H2 and O2. So what happens is that you are, if you are in, if you look in the, in this curve, in the pressure temperature curve, you uh, enter into so-called supercritical regime where you do not have any strong uh, this, um, this separation of liquid dense phase and gaseous phase, but where it's more continuous <laughs> uh, change from very dense to very light uh, uh, flows. Um, so this means that you have completely different thermodynamics. So first of all, it uh, makes it necessary to use a cubic equation of state simply to have the correct mass flow rates, okay? If you, if you take the ideal equation of state with this pressure and temperature uh, conditions, you will not get the, the correct uh, density, so you will not correct the, get the correct mass flow rate. So this is absolutely mandatory. The second uh, problem is that with these different thermodynamics, of course, everything changes, or you can expect that everything changes, in particular, the mixing between a dense uh, fluid and a light fluid. This is uh, a kind of, is this is a, a direct numerical <coughs> simulation of a mixing between a, a hydrogen flow, uh, very cold at 150 uh, Kelvin, and uh, oxygen at 100 Kelvin, and uh, at 100 bars, okay? And uh, doing this, so we perform the DNS because there is no diagnostic, no measurement on this kind of flow. We, can re we don't really know how uh, <laughs> turbulence acts on the mixing. So uh, we did a very fine DNS. To give you an idea, we, had, we put about 100 points uh, to, to discretize uh, the, the separator here. So it makes a very, very uh, small uh, cell size. Uh, but it allows to, to get uh, very nice results. Uh, but then we could apply that to a more uh, applied configuration. So this is uh, the five in coaxial injector configuration uh, that uh, was uh, tested at, uh, at the mascot, mascot test bench in, in Onera in Paris. Um, so you have five coaxial injectors here, and the motivation of this study was the uh, combustion instabilities. So before uh, uh, studying really the pressure, the acoustic uh, modulation effect on this type of flow, we first look at the, what we get when it is uh, just stable. So, <coughs> so you can imagine that each of these uh, injector uh, contains the same uh, flow that I, I just showed uh, the slide before. Uh, this was, so these, these are very ex uh, extremely uh, s expensive uh, simulations and we used uh, price uh, resources. Price uh, is a uh, structure in Europe that allows to get, ac to, ha to, to have access to very, very high uh, computing, compu computing centers and computing power. And so this is what we get. And then uh, um, we could do the same with a mo transverse mo modulation. So, uh, yes, you, you may have mentioned here the mean pressure was 67 uh, bars and the modulation is plus or minus two bars. <laughs> so, uh, it's, it's, uh, experimentally, it's very, very challenging, very dangerous. And uh, they, could, they did not do uh, too many uh, tests at uh, Onera because after a few tests, uh, just the system just broke. Uh, but... Um, we could do the simulation and see the impact of acoustic modulation on the flame. So, of course, it gives some motion, transverse motion to the, to the inject, to the different jets, but it also changes the, cha the shape of, of the jet. They became more flat and uh, they start also to interact one with the other. Uh, the objective of this kind of simulation, of course, it was, it w is to uh, uh, determine the uh, uh, transfer function of the flame and see uh, how this can act on a, or lead to a combustion instability which in rocket engine is always a, an issue. Uh, so this was performed with, uh, of course, real gas thermodynamics in, in the code uh, AVBP. And uh, the final application was uh, the, uh, the HF7 test case 
which is a, uh, it's, it's a test case of the DLR in Lampolthausen, uh, where you have um, a number of injectors. I don't remember how many exactly, but uh, <laughs> quite a number here. So not five, the same coaxial injectors we just saw before, but not five now, we are about between 20 and 30, something like that. And uh, this, uh, this is a model of a rocket engine, okay, the combustion chamber, uh, with a nozzle and the injection system. And the, uh, uh, in the DLR, they found conditions where uh, this uh, system became unstable and conditions where it, it stayed uh, stable. And they, uh, it was proposed as a test case in the REST workshop last year. REST is a European uh, kind of association devoted to a high frequency instability in rocket engines. And uh, the idea was to see if we could uh, reproduce the instabilities. So uh, yes, we could do, uh, we, we found some instabilities, but I will just show here a, a movie to, to show you what the result look like, looks like. Uh, CC, this is um, a result on what we call the coarse grid. So on the coarse grid, we didn't find any instability. It was the first trial. Uh, and then we refine the mesh, and then instability appears. Okay, so to, to capture, uh, this, these phenomena are very strong. I mean, pressure fluctuation are extremely high, but if you want to capture that with simulation, you really need to, to, to pay the price. Okay, um, I think that I will uh, now give you some ideas of what we are currently developing now to go further. So. Um, one, one direction is, of course, two-phase flow. So uh, we have developed, uh, as I said, uh, both Allerian and Lagrangian formulations to, take to, to describe the spray in, in, a, in an injector, in a burner. Uh, but one uh, really open question now uh, when uh, it comes to uh, simulate uh, two phases uh, for combustion in, in gas turbines is the injection. How do you form the spray? How do you... Uh, it describes the size droplet size distribution, etc. So you uh, simulating the whole process of atomization, primary atomization, is uh, very uh, challenging and very difficult and very costly in terms of CPU time. So we we are not at this stage, but what we are, we are more developing um, phenomenological models. As I show an example here, so this is a. Uh, an experiment that was, uh, it's a simulation of an experiment that was done at KIT in Germany, uh, <laughs> where um, a, f a f liquid film is ejected somewhere here on a, on a, on a, on a plate, like on a solid uh, plate here, and uh, flows uh, downstream and then is atomized at the edge of the, um, of, of the plate. And this is a typical phenomenon that we find in air blast atomization in, in real uh, gas turbine engines. And our objective here was to develop a model that was able to reproduce phenomenologically again, not the detail of the processes, but to get a result, a spray at the end that has the correct uh, characteristics. So you have an, um, uh, you can see here um, an animation, okay? So the the liquid uh, flows downstream here, and then it uh, produces droplets, okay? So by uh, reproducing the experiment, we could parameterize this atomization phenomenon and include that in, uh, in uh, simulations. So we now see uh, uh, an example of validation of two-phase combustion in the experiment for Cambridge by Cavalier and Nandas Mastorakos, who is in the room here. Uh, where uh, we have here a solid body uh, uh, with flow, airflow coming around here in a swirl motion and a droplet injection at the center. And what was interested in this, um, in this configuration was uh, the uh, presence of uh, individual burning droplets. And uh, so we developed a model to take uh, into account this um, uh, individual droplet burning because it can make uh, an important difference on the uh, final uh, burner efficiency if you don't take into account these big droplets that are able to cross a flame front and, and burn in the burn gases. And also it has an impact on uh, uh, emissions of uh, unburned, for example, unburned hydrocarbons. 
So it is really important to, to capture that and it was very nice to have an experiment for validation of this, uh, of this um, <coughs> phenomenon. And just an example to show you a final result on a, on a real burner. You have here a multipoint injector. You can see the droplets that are uh, colored by their size um, in the combustion chamber. Okay, uh, another direction where we are do putting a lot of efforts is uh, heat transfer. Uh, I said in the beginning that uh, it is a, a challenging and a crucial uh, issue in, in uh, engine design. So, and also uh, it's another, it's also a, a good answer to the uncertainty of boundary condition I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. Usually you don't know the, the temperature of the solid walls of the combustion chamber if you want to reproduce an experiment. It's very rare that you know exactly the temperature of the walls. This is something you have to fix. Talk to the experimentalist <laughs> and, and say, how do you, what do you mean? What is the temperature? And gives you a number and you go with that. Uh, our answer to that is to include heat transfer in the simulation. So we do not guess the wall temperature, but we compute it. So it really uh, brings uh, accuracy into the simulation, but of course it uh, it um, needs it requires to put a, a chain of uh, of uh, simulation together. So you you have a thermal solver, a heat transfer solver here, uh, <coughs> coupled with the LES, the CFD in the combustion chamber, and possibly if it's important also a, radi a thermal radiation solver. So all these codes exchange um, information at the, uh, at the wall surface and uh, this, uh, the, they are coupled via a software that we have uh, developed at Surfax which is called OpenPalm that is able to uh, handle the different codes, the information they exchange but also, and this is again very important, the uh, distribution uh, of over uh, the processes you are, uh, you are, you are, that are available for your simulation. Typically, uh, this radiation calculation is much more longer for, for one iteration than the LES or the uh, uh, conduction uh, solver. So you have to synchronize everything by uh, uh, playing with the distribution over the processes. And the, the software OpenPAN does that for you. So, uh, very classically, um, you have um, oh, something is missing there. Sorry, uh, the, it's not complete here. But uh, you have a fluid-solid exchange. The fluid sends a thermal flux, a heat flux to the to the solid, and the solid gives a temperature. Uh, we applied that to the uh, same uh, flow that I already shown uh, between uh, the mixing of H two O two in a rocket engine. So you see, you have here an image of the of the flame temperature field here, so for an adiabatic case, where the solid is treated uh, here with a zero heat flux, and then applying the couple, uh, the, the couple strategy to it, we can have a combined result of temperature in the flow and in the fluid and in the <coughs> solid. So this allows to study the impact of the temperature of the wall on the flame stabilization and the impact of heat flux to uh, uh, thermal uh, behavior of the solid. And here we get a uh, temperature uh, boundary condition that makes sense, that is computed and not guessed anymore. Finally, another example of what we are developing now is going to large scale configurations. This is a, a topic uh, linked to a transition to detonation, uh, where we had uh, the chance to, uh, thanks to uh, support of Total, uh, different uh, size uh, experiments from very small to very large and we could uh, compute these ones um, uh, and see the impact of, uh, of this change of length. Okay, Typically in aeronautical uh, burners we are more in, in this range. Okay, So the parameterization for example of the wrinkling of the flame has been uh, validated in, very in quite small flames. And the question was, is it still valid for large flames? And the, runs, the answer was no, and we had to develop a new function, a new parameterization, a kind of dynamic approach for the wrinkling uh, factor of the flame surface. 
And here is an example of what we get. So here is, this is a medium scale experiment uh, on, on top. So I show you first the experiment. So it starts laminar, okay? And it goes through obstacles and when going through obstacles, the flame uh, surface increases and it transitions to, to detonation. And at, at the bottom, you get a simulation. So it's, it's, it's uh, it, oops, sorry. So it's um, quite similar. We could find the same, uh, the same kind of behavior. We start, uh, uh, we start with this one, okay? Sorry. Yeah, we start laminar and then it goes through the obstacles and we could compare the, the, the flame uh, propagation speed and validate that again, these experiments. Okay, I think I will stop here now. Uh, I have uh, many other examples of applications of LES, uh, but uh, I, I, it would be too long to show all of that. But if you're interested, uh, we can have some time to discuss. Thank you.